Thank you very much indeed. Um, Your Royal Highness, distinguished guest, Gebor, thank you very much for inviting me today to give just a few opening remarks and, and thank you for your flexibility in the presentation. Um, I come to you, I guess, in, in a sober mood, but firstly, may I just thank everybody who's listening today, all the friends and partners over the years who worked with us. There are some extraordinary people working on the ground. You've already heard from Royal Highness about the work in Gaza, particularly Shem al uh, Rita Jackman, um, William Hamoud and others who worked with us, and, and we stand in solidarity with them. And I'll talk a little bit more about Gaza to go through. Um, the UN Secretary General before Gaza stood up in front of the, the General Assembly and said, our world is becoming unhinged, and how right he was. Um, we're facing more than just existential threats at the moment. We are, we are dealing with reality, um, a massively non-aligned world, what has been considered to be the long, slow death of global development generally. And, and these are tectonic movements, I think, that uh, Sir Royal Hannes has already said, are going to define the, the next 10 to 20 years, if not further. So with that in mind, I just want to maybe just give some uh, opening comments on just the conflict settings. Uh, as many of you listening will know, of course, fragile conflict and violence is, is now one of the greatest health and development challenges. We're beyond 82 million forcibly displaced people. I think we're now about 103 million globally. Nearly all of them are hosted in other vulnerable populations and countries as well. Um, and, and the displacements are extraordinary because they last for a long, long time. And most of the displacements come from very few countries around the world. And this really frames, I think, the challenges we have for cancer control and health generally going forward. And this graph just gives you an idea of just the extraordinary numbers of displaced people going back to the 1970s from different wars through the Balkans, the Syrian conflict. And you'll see this massive increase now as well. Uh, and again, it's really hard to put this into words because it's difficult until you actually see this for real, until you stand in a camp in the middle of nowhere, watching the rain pounding down on vulnerable people. It's hard to just express just how vulnerable these populations are and how much the world has failed them. But this gives you the context to cancer and the difficulty of delivering cancer care. And of course, the type of conflict and insecurity creates the context. Um, we're obviously focusing a lot on the Middle East at the moment, but if you just cast your mind across the world, you'll see that we have massive displacement occurring in Latin America, Venezuelan refugees. We still have the narco wars going on in Mexico. Half of all sub-Saharan African countries are undergoing armed conflict, and it is getting worse across the whole of the Sahel, for example. So instability and violence is becoming a normative property. So what do we know? Well, I'm sorry to come to say this, but I'm going to say out, up front, basically, the data on what's happening in conflict camps is a bit of a mess. In certain stable regions like Jordan, for example, and Turkey, and you'll hear a lot more about this today from, from friends and colleagues, the data is much better. But generally, when you stand back, our data on inequalities, on incidents, on outcomes, etc., is relatively poor because it's really hard doing this work. And it's not just the absolute numbers. We're also missing enormous amounts of qualitative work. So in other words, the lived experience of cancer patients in these environments, because that determines an awful lot of the kind of care that we need to develop for our patients there. Uh, and I would say this, and I'm not going to see Tezza's thunder slightly here. He's done absolutely extraordinary work. And I just want to recognize the amazing amount of work that they've done in Turkey. And I'm sure he'll be presenting this data as well. But just to look at this, this is the cap the mass survival curves. And this is settings it, it, which are almost the best settings you can for a refugee. And even then, survival is poor and it's inequitable. So you can imagine in other places where we haven't got good data what the outcomes must be like. The other problem, I think, from a policy perspective is to persuade policymakers to change, we have to come up with a good economic argument. And actually, the reality is that we haven't got good economic arguments because we haven't been good about collecting the data about the cost of treating those patients, what that returns in terms of productivity um, gains, and also what the out-of-pocket expenditures for patients are. We have a lot of quality of data showing that expenditures on cancer care and refugees are ruinous. They don't just destroy the family now, they also destroy future families in terms of expenditure. But without collecting this data, it can be very hard for any policymaker to change. 
What we do have is a better understanding of just how complex the therapeutic job is down down with driving inequalities and conflict. And that's thanks to Omar Dawachi, people like Max Skelton. And again, a lot of work that's been done across the Middle East showing the movements of patients in relation to insecurity and conflict as they're seeking cancer care. And I particularly want to point out this paper from a colleague, Asim Yosef, um, who's done some remarkable work looking at the movement of Afghani patients into Pakistan. And again, the incredible complexity over time and space in terms of these movements. Let me just now reflect on Gaza. I, I mean, it is really a reflection of just the horrors of modern warfare. The weapons that are being dropped at the moment on Gaza, these GB31 high explosive weapons, have a kill radius of about a kilometre, but they destroy everything within five kilometres, and thousands of these have been dropped. So the harm we often focus on is direct harm in those people killed immediately. But of course, these sorts of impacts have enormous consequences downstream. And, and, and this is the problem. Cancer treatment is hospital-based by and large, and it's very sensitive to any form of shock. When a shockwave hits a hospital, and the power gets knocked out, the med tech immediately falls over. Our CT scanners stop, our blood analyzing machines stop, everything fails. And then, of course, on top of that, of course, the, the shock waves fracture the oxygen supplies within hospitals. Waste management collapses because it fractures all the water supply in the hospitals. And of course, things like basic 101, fresh frozen plasma, blood products, all the things we need, Finish. Why do they finish? Because all the temperature control devices we have also implode. So you can imagine it doesn't need a bomb to drop on a hospital to essentially end cancer care. And of course, the more complex the services are, the faster they degrade. So one of the greatest losses we saw immediately in Gaza was, of course, the big things like renal and cancer care, because, of course, the shockwaves were knocking out the high-tech equipment we need. And this is very, very different from dealing with 101 infectious disease or child and maternal mortality. The other thing, as I think people fail to focus on, is, of course, the massive displacement of healthcare personnel. And again, we're seeing in Gaza and we've seen in other conflicts a shift of specialised cancer care personnel to immediately doing two things. One is dealing with acute emergency care. And number two is, of course, those healthcare personnel then going back to their social group, looking after family members that have been bereaved looking after their children. And, and we fail as well to realise there's an enormous degrading aspect of conflict on healthcare personnel, not just killing personnel, and a lot of that's happened, but also the morbidity, the burnout, the systems breakdown. So these consequences of conflict are dramatic, and particularly for healthcare workers, really, really long term. But as Roy Hine has already mentioned, it depends on what the international community does and, and how much there is support. And as she rightly said, what we saw in Ukraine was what we can deliver if the international community gets behind services. So despite the attacks on infrastructure in Ukraine, what we saw is those services getting back up very, very quickly. I mean, we saw a lot of Linux and radiotherapy being knocked out because of the power outages, but they were only down for between three and four weeks because of the speed of the international response to get them working again. So Ukraine, if you like, stands as an example of what can be achieved if the international community actually does deliver. So let me just give you the final finding solutions because problems are easier to articulate. Um, first and foremost, absolutely spot on. If you are continually violating international humanitarian law, we might as well all pack up and go home. We've said this again and again and again. We saw this in Iraq. I'm sure Nazik will talk about that with Sudan's concerned and Gaza. Cancer is fundamentally the tip of the spear when it comes to healthcare systems. And if we fail to protect health and healthcare workers are a target, then the, the conversation can stop there. The new models of care, I think, are taking into account very, very different settings. We're seeing more complex emergencies, in other words, conflict and high threat disease outbreaks in sub-Saharan Africa and eastern Congo, for example, with Ebola and the conflicts there. And as we said before, cancer is really a hospital-based system that you have to protect. And the destruction we see of infrastructure is one thing, but really the key thing is healthcare workers. You can rebuild hospitals. It's very hard to rebuild your healthcare workforce.
my view is UNHCR and INGOs have no concept of cancer, and, and I'm sure people may want to argue with me about this, but there are no standard models built into any of these systems at the moment because they don't come from this basis. They come from an infectious disease, old school humanitarianism. And I think that probably needs to change going forward. I think Gaza and the Sudan and Syria will have to make them change in terms of building in models and systems of care. And finally, to say that policymakers do need specific insight. Um, we do need to develop a much deeper insight into the political economy of cancer and conflict. We need to make the economic case. And most of all, we need to make the moral case as well. So thank you very much indeed for listening today. And I'll hand back to our chair for um, the rest of the day. Thank you.